Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to Expo Weekend Lectures. I'm Heather Ward with SCA, and I'm your staff host for this lecture. So welcome to Competing Online in a Quickly Changing World. Before we start the presentation, we would like to thank our, all of our Expo Weekend sponsors, Pacific Barista Series as the title sponsor, and Saver Brands, Chemix, and Rostar as underwriters. So just to note, the panel will take questions at the end of the discussion. Um, please type in your questions into the Q&A tab. It's next to the chat that you'll see on your dashboard. So today will be a panel discussion, and I would like to introduce the moderator of this panel, Ashley Hildreth. And Ashley leads the North American Partnerships team at Trustpilot, the leading global customer review platform. In her role, she's Ex she's expanded Trustpilot's partner program to include hundreds of partners, including premier agency, technology, and platform partners. So I'm going to hand it over to Ashley to introduce the rest of the panel and get the discussion started. And I will be jumping in towards the end for the Q&A session. Awesome. Thank you, Heather. Really excited to be here today. And thank you to everyone who's joining us. Um, though, of course, we wish the circumstances were different and we could be seeing you all in person. Um, we are glad to be here to talk to you today about what it means to compete online in what is now a very quickly changing world. Traditional distribution me methods have been disrupted, and if you weren't already online, you're probably racing to get there now. So as the online market becomes more saturated, we're here to discuss how you can remain competitive. So to answer those questions, we'll be discussing today digital strategies you can act on, optimizing for the customer experience so they stay loyal, and preparing for future and ongoing disruptions or a return, hopefully soon, to normalcy. So we've got a panel of experts here, to, here with us today. And so before we jump in, we'll do a quick round of introductions. Um, Heather, you already gave me a pretty great introduction there, uh, but as Heather mentioned, I do oversee the partnerships team at Trustpilot, so we work very closely uh, with digital agencies, technology platforms, and solutions uh, to help our customers integrate their reviews into their digital marketing strategies. And with that, I'll turn the mic over to Erin, our industry expert, uh, to introduce herself. Hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, like Ashley said, I am Erin Hoffman, and I am with Door County Coffee. We are a specialty coffee roaster in business for 27 years in Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin. And I am the director of e-commerce here, which brings me to this discussion today. Um, my role here is to manage um, all of our platforms online, whether it's our own direct consumer or marketplaces, as well as help drive acquisition there. And you know, we've seen um, a lot of change in the last month, as all retailers have. We've not been immune to the changes of COVID-19 um, from our cafe and physical store, as well as our food service division with so many restaurants closed. But uh, fortunately, our grocery store sales, as well as our online sales, have really been interesting and really has um, helped us to connect to the consumer still during this time. So hoping to share a little insights about what we've been doing um, over the last few weeks today. Awesome. Thank you, Erin. Dan, how about yourself? Sure thing, Ashley. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, Dan Fertig here. Uh, I'm the Global Director of Agency Partnerships for BigCommerce. Uh, for those uh, that are not familiar with BigCommerce, we are the industry's most versatile solution for advancing your e-commerce experiences. We are the e-commerce platform serving over 60,000 merchants, including over 600 merchants in the coffee and beverage industry. One thing that I'll probably touch on, and it ties into Aaron's uh, points uh, as part of her introduction, our, our typical merchant growth rate uh, year over year is, is about 29% on the platform. Um, but that growth rate in April alone is closer to 80% across our platform. And so, you know, there are industries such as food and beverage that are really seeing that outsized growth. So what I hope to be able to talk about today is some of those levers and some of those tactics that, you know, our best performing merchants are utilizing to be able to experience that type of growth. Looking forward to the conversation. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Dan. Ryan, I'll let you take it away. Hi, thank you. My name is Ryan Garrow. Uh, I'm the Director of Partnerships and Client Solutions at Logical Position. 
Logical Position is one of the largest digital agencies on the planet. We've got about 6,500 active clients that we manage the digital ads for, social ads, Amazon ads. We manage email. Uh, we build a few websites, but mainly the digital marketing side. I've uh, been with them about four years since they acquired the company I was uh, CEO of. It was another digital marketing agency. And my wife and I still own five businesses. So I, and a few of them are e-commerce. So we sell a lot online and leverage a lot of the digital marketing that hopefully we'll get a touch on today. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. So we're going to um, jump right into it. And we do want to make sure that our listeners today do come away with some clear action items and ideas to stay competitive online. So with that in mind, we're going to kick the conversation off by talking about digital acquisition. Um, so, Ryan, I'm going to put you right in the hot seat there um, <laughs> and ask what kind of tips you have for online retailers um, to stay competitive within their paid ads. Well, this is a it's a unique time in history, which I don't think anybody would deny the. The key in this area is, is maintaining some flexibility, I think, because Google's done some very interesting things in this time period as well. Uh, changing things, which Google's very good at. Uh, they're always keeping things moving and, and adjusting, which yeah, I joke regularly about, but that's one of the reasons I have a job is because Google changes all the time. Uh, and just recently, they've announced some big changes in shopping um, and how that's going to be uh, adjusted, not only for the paid side, but also for the organic side. And so uh, generally, my rule of thumb uh, on acquisition is aggressive. I want to get customers. And especially when you're selling a product that has a high lifetime value of a customer, uh, most companies I talk to before they work with us uh, aren't aggressive enough generally on what they're willing to spend to acquire a customer. And so that's one of the first steps is saying, okay, if I've in the past been willing to accept this cost of acquisition, I'm going to move that up uh, with all the data we have around Google and acquisition and even Bing ads being a big source of new traffic for a lot of our brands. Uh, it's most e-com sites are seeing CPCs go down. A lot of them. Coffee is going in the other direction. It is a lot of companies that weren't selling online are getting online. And I think Dan's going to touch on that later. But it's with the competition increasing and people used to drink coffee at in the office and now they're drinking it at home. Like my home consumption has skyrocketed uh, uh, over the last month and a half. It's, it's getting competitive even more so. <laughs> and so I think it's monitoring and uh, keeping up on that and that flexibility in there. It's, and so don't be afraid to be aggressive and put some money towards acquisition, I think is one of the key points right now in this space. Sure. Um, and and we were we were chatting earlier, and you were mentioning that there were some changes uh, and opportunities to help um, just from an organic traffic perspective. Mm -hmm. um, what what can you suggest that you know? I know SEO is typically like a long term play, but are there any short term opportunities for brands to try and drive organic traffic in these current in this current environment? Yeah. So if you're one of the retailers that was forced online very, very quickly within the last month or two, chances of you outranking a larger competitor that's been online for a decade is in the, in the short run going to be difficult and probably unlikely. And so some of the things you can be doing uh, to take advantage of the, the what they call the free shopping clicks, which are the organic things. If you've been in the digital marketing world as long as I have, you remember something called Frugal, which was free Google shopping ads. Uh, Google's basically brought that back up. And so if you click on that shopping tab on Google, so I've searched for dark roast coffee and I click that shopping tab, what you'll have is a, a row generally. And if like, you're on a desktop like I am right now, you'll see a row of coffee that matches that. And those are the sponsored ads. Below that, you'll see it just kind of the normal grid that you're used to seeing in Google shopping. And you can hover over on the right and it says about for these clicks. And so opportunity, even in very recent entrance into the online space to actually rank there. To do that, you actually need a Merchant Center account. So in Google, there are really four important things, but for this piece, you need to have a Merchant Center. So if you just Google Google Merchant Center, um, if you have a platform 
uh, like a big commerce, you can just send your feed right in there. All of your products will go magically into the Google uh, Merchant Center. That is usually used for Google Ads. So that's how you pay for the shopping ads within the Google platform. Google also uses that feed to help rank organically within those spaces um, that are free below the fold there. And so uh, there's, not a, there's not a company right now in existence that sells online that I wouldn't recommend having a Google Merchant Center account opened. You give your products fed into that. Uh, to rank on there, it just started on Monday. So there's a lot of testing and measuring going on right now. Uh, we've, we're on some important Google beta teams internally. Um, we've got some insights into things that Google is choosing to rank uh, higher than other merchants. And so one of the things to be aware of is uh, reviews. Um, thankfully, we have Trustpilot here, but merchant reviews and product reviews are both important in who Google is going to rank higher organically. They don't want an advertiser that they don't know any information about ranking really high for a term that's, that Google's somewhat going to be responsible for that person buying that product. And so they want a quality trusted uh, merchant. They want products that people have reviewed. So make sure you're pushing those out to Google, which means you, you can't just use the general plugin on a platform to do that. There has to be a, a review company that is trusted by Google. Um, mm -hmm. And that's talk to Trustpilot if you need that for sure. And then the other piece that is, is flying under the radar for sure is the shipping times. So it's your processing and times in transit to the searcher. So understanding how you're writing your schema markup on the site itself and what you're telling Google about your shipping times. If, if the same product is competing to show from two different retailers and one of them can ship it to me in two days and the other one's gonna take a week and a half, Google's gonna raise up the one that can ship quickest to me. That's the expectation of, of most people searching Google is I see it, click it, I want it now. I don't wanna wait a week and a half. Amazon's already doing that to me. So let's, let's get it to me now. Um, so those are probably the most important things. And then understanding titles and the way you're describing your product and your merchant center has an impact as well. Uh, but that's a lot of testing and measuring as well and finding out how your titles or descriptions are gonna compete in that free space. Yeah, that's, that's kind of wild. I mean, I know that there's like a lot of um, expectations these days and Amazon seems to really be setting the bar in terms of um, what we expect from um, brands to deliver on. So it's always <laughs> interesting to me to see how Google is integrating that into their algorithms and making shifts, especially when it comes to their ad center and their shopping listings. Um, you know, Dan, it, it, I know that you had mentioned there's a couple of techniques that you've seen um, brands do in terms of setting those consumer expectations when they've landed yeah. on the brand's website directly. Um, what kind of recommendations do you have that you can share? Yeah, I was going to say it, it's funny. So um, not to be political, but certainly there's a, a you know concern around transparency nowadays. And um, what we're seeing is the merchants that are most transparent on their the setting expectations for consumers are the ones that are going to be gaining loyalty in the long term. And <laughs> while it seems that Google is prioritizing uh, merchants who can get the product to you faster, as consumers, especially right now, we seem to generally be more understanding that it may take a little bit longer than expected. And so my recommendation there is if you are a... a um, you know, roaster or specialty coffee company that is having some type of inventory constraints or delivery constraints, um, be transparent about the, that and set expectations, whether it's on the top of the site, whether it's on the product detail page, um, be really detailed around when we believe we can get the, the product to the consumer. Having said that, would strongly recommend, um, if you are having some of those constraints, to do two things in particular. Number one is set back in stock notifications. It's actually a really good way since that person is literally already on your site trying to buy a product. If you don't have it available for them, it's a great opportunity for you to get them to sign up for either SMS or email to be notified when that product does become available again. Um, and if you do believe it's going to be a little bit of time before it does become available, set pre-orders as well. So you can mm -hmm. actually take that pre-order, you can take some portion of that payment um, mm -hmm. without taking the full order. And that pre-order is good. Most most gateways will hold that pre-order for about 30 days. 
Um, and so that will actually allow you to, if you then later on are able to get your facility back up and get your employees back and running and fulfilling orders, um, that's a great way to have existing in, um, you know, purchases that you can go and, and fulfill pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've, we've had to do that with a few of our SKUs. For the most part, we've been able to keep up with demand um, amazingly based on just shifting um, workflow that would be supporting other parts of our business that aren't functioning at full tilt right now to the e-commerce side. Um, we've been able to stay in stock, but for the issues where we weren't, um, you know, Ashley talked about Amazon. We like to call it the Amazon effect. You know, they're the ones that have made us feel like we need to deliver everything tomorrow. And they're also the ones that are now making us feel like, okay, we have a couple weeks. People are comfortable with this. So what we've done is we've just said, you know, it'd be maybe a couple weeks out. We'll ship April 30th. It's extremely rare that we would ever do that. Usually if we're out of stock, we mark it out of stock because people don't want to wait, but it has been a different experience right now. Um, and just recently we started receiving some um, delays, not so much in our end, but from our shipping partners because they're also trying to manage this huge um, influx that happened in April. So we've had to add a notification to our shipping notification that yes, it is on the way from here, but keep in mind, um, there are some delays from our carriers. And again, it's just the transparency, like Dan mentioned. And, you know, people haven't been upset. They've been actually responding. Oh, thank you for the update. We hope you're all staying well, staying healthy. Um, it's definitely a different pace for everyone right now. Yeah, absolutely. I know um, with our our brands that have reviews on Trustpilot, like they're also showcasing the, the impact of their business on their their profile pages as well. So. It's interesting to see um, not only thinking about having those kind of consumer alerts on your own pages and that to set those expectations on your own properties, but mm -hmm. also thinking about other areas where people are researching your brand that you could also okay. leverage that as an opportunity to communicate with them as well. Mm -hmm. um, so as we're, as we're thinking about other channels, um, you know, there's obviously a variety of places beyond Amazon that you could also be, di be distributing products through. Um, Aaron, where are you guys seeing you know, some big booms um, for your brand? Yeah, so the boom, I mean, it's been um, across the board. Our direct to consumer site has really, really exploded. We're seeing numbers that are comparable, if not more than what we experienced during cyber time, which is something we built for the entire year that kind of just happened overnight. Um, and then Amazon, fortunately, we, um, coffee is deemed an essential product with which I think everyone on this webinar would probably agree with. So we, yeah, and can you imagine quarantine without it? I mean, it just, I can't. So we've been able to ship in our products. We still did see some delays with them just because the demand went crazy overnight. Um, so we've experienced some substantial year over year growth there, as well as Walmart is another marketplace that we're on. Um, we are merchant fulfilled for Walmart, so we've fulfilled direct um, from our facilities. And yeah, that has been a huge increase compared to what we would normally see during this April timeframe. So all areas um, of online business have really uh, grown substantially over the last seven, eight weeks, I think is when this all started. I mean, one thing I've noticed uh, with one of my brands is an organic fertilizer. And while it's not probably essential in Amazon's eyes, they do make exceptions for high volume things, which is a very interesting <laughs> wording they use, uh, gave them a lot of flexibility. So they've allowed us to be continually updating our supply, but just getting it to the primary warehouse doesn't mean it goes all over the country. And so we ran some tests to say, okay, yeah, where you have, I think we're limited to 2,300 units at a time. So I'm sending inventory every day, but we uh, flipped on our fulfilled by merchant listing just to see what it would do if our FBA listing maybe had holes in it. Turns out the East Coast, because I'm on the West Coast, um, our, our East Coast uh, states started buying a lot of uh, fulfilled by merchant listings. Even though we had inventory in FBA, it just hadn't made it all over the country because the volume had been high enough on the West Coast. It just kind of never made it on trucks all the way over. And so it's yeah. something if you already have it, see if you can flip it on and just test and see how that volume can be impacted if you have the ability to fulfill by merchant as well as FBA on Amazon. Mm -hmm. yeah. So um, 
uh, in regards to just kind of maybe switching roles there and mo- moving on to the next thing, um, one thing that we haven't touched on yet is social. So, Aaron, I'd love to hear how you guys are approaching uh, some of the social channels and what you're seeing success yeah. in and any other tips you can share. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, you know, I think it's been true for everyone. It, here we are all connecting and at this conference. We would have all been together at and now it's virtual. Um, you know, connecting online has been the way that people have been gravitating and towards each other, the only way that they can connect. And so there's so many more people interacting with us on social media. We've always had pretty high engagement on Facebook, but it's it's through the roof now. And our social media manager has been doing a great job putting out all kinds of different content, um, looking for feedback. And, you know, we do things, hey, show us your favorite mug. Generally, you'll get a couple people to participate. It, I mean, it's just been through the roof engagement and what that has brought is all this user generated content that is just kind of coming out of the woodwork based on everyone's behavior right now um we've also you know sharing different content on social media we had to kind of take our promotional calendar and all the messages we had planned out and look at them are they appropriate is there something that would be more helpful and um we've started a series where one of our teammates is now doing video series from home tips on how to brew your coffee at home, tips on how to make cold brew at home, the types of things you'd go to the cafe for. So the content has really changed, but people have been so engaged. And, um, you know, the user generated content has just been, influencers are kind of coming out of the woodwork without us seeking them out. And so it's been really great. We've been trying to, you know, grasp onto it, share as much as possible and um, just keep it going. And Dan, did you have anything you wanted to add there? Um, yeah, I would say, yeah, and, and to Aaron's point, you know, a lot of people are engaging socially right now because it's a way for us to connect. Um, and you see people who are you know, trying to become amateur baristas and um, so coffee is an inherently social, you know, consumption product, isn't it? Like, my wife won't even talk to me until she's had coffee. That's how social it is. So, um, <laughs> You know, we're, we're seeing merchants though, like there's a couple of different approaches that we're seeing and, and these are not mutually exclusive. Um, so the first is kind of beautifully, beautiful, creative, curated, but shoppable posts um, that our merchants are doing, right? It could be just a beautiful um, image of a perfectly crafted latte and you can, you know, shop here to you know, purchase the syrup that was, is being sold or any other beans that are being sold in that image. We're also, and I love this, um, we're seeing um, a lot of our merchants, especially in the food and beverage industry, um, use this opportunity to show themselves, right? And so it's their employees giving out, you know, their their favorite type of coffee or their favorite coffee beverage and why, and um, reminding consumers that like these companies are actually made up of humans and those humans are, you know, everyday people like you and me, and it's not just, I'm buying it from this company. Um, so both like both ends of the spectrum, like super organic. My employees are posting cool things that people it's resonating with people, but then also really nice, cu- uh, creative and shoppable posts as well across Facebook and Instagram for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, um, how about like Aaron, you touched on on influencers. It sounds like that's something that um, is happening organically. Um, or do you have influencers that you guys are working with to help promote your brand? Um, it's been pretty organic for the most part. Um, we've, you know, and a lot of our influencers actually that we have worked with over the years have been organic um, because we've found that people that are already passionate about it and sharing in different ways, you know, our, we, our social media manager does a good job of vetting them and watching for them. And then we've created partnerships out of that. But really, I mean, we're getting, um, pictures of people opening their boxes or their box and their kids now building a fort out of it because they're all home and people are just sending us this content um, without a whole lot of uh, requests for it. So it's just been a a really a different time of interacting, but it's been a great way for us to, um, again, touch the consumer during this time. My household since since quarantine has turned into like barista central. So it's constantly like YouTube is playing with a lot of <laughs> coffee experts. Um, we're just ingesting so much content right now, trying to make the best cup of coffee and replicate that cafe experience that you know, we, we don't have anymore. So um, 
yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to watch. <laughs> yeah, you know, the National um, Coffee Association came out with a study just a few weeks ago, which was from the early part, the early part of findings from this year so far. And it said 63% of people surveyed had access to coffee at their workplace. So now imagine the majority of those people who are, were always just getting it from the office coffee workplace, they're now at home. And they're needing to find a way, like all of you said, needing to find a way to get that coffee to their house to brew. So it's totally changed the way people are consuming it. And fortunately, coffee is a product that is consumed almost everywhere. Um, you know, it's like maybe it's because I've been teaching my children lately at home as well while I'm working. But it's like the cat in the hat, right? He'll he'll drink coffee on a boat. He'll drink coffee with a goat. You know, I mean, coffee is not something that when certain industries close down, there's still another way for people to get it. So while we love to be still serving people at workplaces, we're still, we are able to at least reach them in their homes. Um, you know, the key will be how we continue to engage with them afterwards. Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's, it's a huge opportunity um, to capture an audience that is now looking for some of that instruction on, you know, how to do it at home. Um, but also, you know, with some of the changes that are being made on Amazon and just some of the um, fulfillment issues that many brands are running into today, it's a big opportunity for brands to capture and create um, a relationship with customers that they may not have otherwise had. Um, so that opens up, you know, an, an interesting discussion around uh, email marketing and how to keep people engaged once you're able to capture those new, new, new customers. Um, so Aaron, I think you, you've been seeing some pretty great success, um, through that, that avenue as well. Yeah. Um, we believe strongly in email, email marketing. Um, you know, one of the big things, um, that we've been trying to focus on with our Google ad strategy is new email acquisition. And so growing that database is a huge, huge push for us always. And is year round, it is our biggest driver of traffic to our website. Um, but so we've always had pretty strong engagement and we, we put a lot of time and energy into it, but our open rates, when I looked at March and April compared to January and February, we've seen a 4% increase in open rates and in email open rate based on our database size, that's a big jump. I mean, I'm typically happy with a 1% jump. So people just like with social are extremely engaged with everything that's landed in their inbox because they have more time to go through it. Um, so we've continued some of our promotional messaging. Uh, you know, as soon as it happened, one of the biggest takes was to look at all of our email automation and make sure nothing was untimely, nothing was worded Ill, you know, inappropriately based on what everyone was going through. Um, so we've continued, been able to modify that and then continue a, a nice promotional schedule. And then um, we've also been sending more content via email that's been more helpful taking some of our old blogs that were about brewing coffee or saving on your coffee and repurposing them and, uh, you know, ways to things to do at home with your coffee grounds, make your own soap, use them in your house plant, you know, just a lot of different things. We typically don't have as much of a um, email content like of that nature, but we, our social media manager and our, she developed our blog as well, has done a great job really adjusting all of our content and keeping them engaged. So, um, that's been huge. Gave me some ideas about how I could use my coffee grounds. <laughs> yeah. You need to see, you know, you need to awesome. There's lots of fun things you can do with them. So. Well, we have our resident soil expert, so maybe Ryan. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> Are there, is there coffee grounds in there? <laughs> um, Dan, did you have anything else that you wanted to add in terms of like other ways to reach customers? Yeah, I mean, I would definitely echo what Aaron is saying, right? Like we're we're seeing open rates across clients of emails that rival um, Cyber Five, and the average American prior to um, social distancing and quarantine, the average American checked her phone 80 times a day, um, and there are some studies now that are showing that that's up over 50 percent, um, and so it's not a surprise that consumers are spending more time engaged digitally. That's it's their coworkers, coworkers certainly, but it's the brands with whom they choose to shop. Um, one thing that we believe is underutilized, but we're seeing incredible return on investment for our customers is in the area of SMS and text messaging. 
Um, that is a really valuable opt-in to secure from a merchant. Um, and it should, it, it should be treated as such, right? And not to be abused. Um, we're seeing 95% open rates of SMS messages on clients. Not surprising, I've opted in to receive a text message. The vast majority of us will look at a text message that we receive. Um, but where you need to be able to differentiate and not have somebody opt out after two text messages is by creating value. So things like, you know, every Monday morning, a text message with a 10% offer that's good for that week, and maybe a link to a video that was created around, you know, a special flavor of, of the week or something, a special type of beverage of the week um, brought to you by, you know, that coffee merchant. Um, something that is engaging, something that um, I've opted into because there's value for me as a consumer. Um, if you're not exploring SMS as a channel for you now, we strongly encourage you to do so. Yeah, I myself, I've also since quarantine seem to be doubling down on enrolling for SMS. <laughs> Maybe I'm just a little more open to it these days, but I'd imagine that um, that's the same across many people. Um, so while we're at it, we're kind of diving into taking a pivot from digital acquisition into loyalty. So I do want to just expand on um, some additional ways in which we can enrich that uh, relationship with our current customer. Um, so who wants to take that? Aaron, do you want to maybe share some of the stuff that you guys are doing to try and encourage repeat purchases? Yeah, so we've got a nice um, workflow automation that we, we've got some through email marketing that we're using, and we've gone in and adjusted that a little bit based on the current timelines. But, you know, we've always got our emails that are going out uh, at a timely basis afterwards to how was your order, and then um, asking them to, with a coupon to come back. Same thing with... Um, Anyone who's a, a, what you would call a lapsed buyer that hasn't purchased in a while, we use email automation for to get them back in that instance as well. Um, you know, ratings and reviews is something that and it's another touch point that we feel can engage them and, again, bring them back into the fold, bring them back to the website, potentially uh, create that repeat purchase. And we do that via email as well. So a lot of our um, loyalty driving currently um, to get that second purchase is done um, through email this time. Maybe SMS yeah, some at some point. Yeah, and I, I could I could add to that. I mean, you know, Ryan mentioned earlier how ratings and reviews are critical now from a listing standpoint when it comes to yeah. search. Um, like I would I would be thinking of a loyalty or rewards program along the same critical lines because. Mm -hmm. you know, these are these are times where you have an audience that is quite literally captive and they if they want coffee it's really difficult to get unless they're getting it to their home and so um you know i would be thinking about my loyalty program now not just because it'll get somebody to a second and a third order potentially but it is a it is a tool to allow you to learn more about who you're selling your coffee to right mm -hmm. and so it's, you know, I might have purchased something for myself once, but if you can learn about me and you know that I have several teenage children who all of a sudden, you know, who are starting to drink coffee and they're not necessarily a consumer of your brand yet. And they may have historically over the last few years been making their own coffee consumption purchases. Like it's an opportunity for you to have a relationship with more people than just the one person whose credit card is on that subscription. Right. And so there are households now that you can tap into and use your initial buyer as, um, for lack of a better term, a Trojan horse to establish a relationship with, you know, more of the household potentially. Um, so mm -hmm. certainly I'd be thinking of loyalty programs in that regard. I would say gift cards are really valuable right now. Um, I'll tie that into SMS, right? Like when we do hopefully sometimes soon, knock on wood, return back to normal, whatever normal looks like. You know, the hope is that I'll get to walk into a coffee shop again, one of my favorite things to do in the world. And, you know, wouldn't it be cool if, you know, I ordered coffee from you and, as, and if I sign up for SMS, you're going you're gonna to text me a QR code that I can use for in-store um, redemption, right? So we're, we're here and we're waiting for you in our physical brick and mortar location. We'd love to welcome you into our store. Once we're able to open it back up, thanks for subscribing to our coffee. 
here's a $10 gift card for the next time you're able to walk into our store. Um, things like that, things like, you know, making sure that you're the subscription model that gets, that doesn't get cut from, you know, tighter family budgets right now. Um, you know, 30 million households have filed unemployment in the last month. So a lot of people who are taking a look at what subscriptions am I paying? Everything from Netflix to my car insurance. And, um, you know, what are you doing to make sure that your subscription isn't going to get cut from that budget, right? It's surprising and telling your customers you have a surprise for them in next month's subscription, for example. Um, so they, they're excited and looking forward to that. And you're not the subscription they choose to cut right now in terms of that. Um, those are all things that keep people engaged with you and help you foster longer term relationships for sure. Um, hopefully yeah. that's helpful. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, you know, I know that we're, we're all looking at this as temporary and we're all very eager to get back to that next new normal. Um, so that actually gives us um, a pretty easy segue into what happens next. Like, how do we take that future focused approach and prepare for what that new normal is going to look like? Um, so Ryan, I'd, I'd be interested to hear how your team is approaching that with your clients and what kind of recommendations that you might be able to share as we prepare to get back into the office one day soon, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, someday, we hope. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're preparing for almost every scenario. And I, and I, because we don't know if we start coming back, you know, to normal, and then we start getting an increase in, in COVID-19, then we go right back to where we are now. It could be released and we figure out, oh, this actually isn't as bad as we thought it was, and we're gonna go instantly back to almost exactly where we were. Um, and so any client that we're talking to about what happens on the other side of this, it's like you have to have a lot of different plans lined up, ready to execute and pivot quickly. Um, do I think that no matter what, we're all gonna jump back into an office at the same rate? No, I don't. I mean, even us, we have a 650 employees around the U.S. and we are looking at, okay, do we have maybe half and half? Like, hey, this week you're in the office, this week you're in the office, and we have a it's kind of a rotation around that. And if that's the case where I think what Aaron said was somewhere around 65% of people had office coffee, that's going to change consumption again. So we're going to move back from the house to the office, but not all the way. And so there's still going to be a massive opportunity to in the copy space, continue to supplying me at home. And I think it's as Americans moving to online purchases, you know, we already knew e-commerce was growing. I mean, Dan's numbers alone, just talk to how astronomical the growth is in e-commerce. Um, we're only going to continue buying more and more online. And I think we just accelerated the curve up. And so make sure that you're selling online period, and then use this time to experience who your customers are and who they could be. And then those audiences can be leveraged in the future to re-engage them or also get them to try new things. I think um, as we're stuck at home, people are you know, somewhat bored. And so we have a lot of people trying new things. I mean, my Instagram feed is full of people that have never mowed their lawn before now gardening. And so <laughs> it's, I think people are going to be willing to try new things. And I think it's our job as uh, e-commerce merchants, retailers to find opportunities to get those in front of people. So the more consumers you can capture right now, or the more insights you can get, the more you can use lookalike audiences on social, lookalike audiences on Google to figure out where can I find more of these people that liked this and keep segmenting. It's going to be more and more about data, even more so than it was before, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, this is also, like you said, it's changing a lot of like people's behavior. And, you know, now we're going to all be used to buying things online, turning to Amazon, turning to your sites to make purchases. Um, you know, I can't go to a restaurant anymore. I have to I have to place that order on Seamless and either do go pick it up curbside or hopefully get it delivered. Um, so I think in this industry as well, that's going to make it make an impact. I know, Aaron, this has impacted your cafe. Um, you know, how do you guys plan to prepare for that in the future? Yeah, I, you know, I think one of the biggest things that we're trying to take note of is, yes, a lot of things are working now and working in different ways because of the state that we're all in. But can some of these big wins that we're experiencing now still be part of our strategy as we transition? So um, the cafe is one of them. So we we have a physical uh, we have one brick and mortar here on our roasting facility and a cafe. And we have kept the drive through open, but typically the drive through is a latte, a smoothie maybe a muffin or a cookie. That's pretty much it. 
but we've tried to do as much as we possibly could through that drive through just as a service to anyone that's still in the area. And um, we've done as much we could as far as our regular cafe menu, as well as actual packaged coffee. Um, we've never sold packaged coffee through the drive through window before. And we're finding like, hey, that people are interested in this. It's kind of the, the bulbous, you know, the buy online, pick up in store. So we've had no strategy for that because when we've looked at it in the past, we didn't think there was enough demand, nor was there a system to do it. And now we're finding maybe we can do this. Maybe there is interest in it. So some of the things that have been working now, um, again, we like Ryan said, we don't know what it's going to look like as things change. But we do think that there are some of the things we've learned that we can transition um, into into our everyday strategy with the picking up in cafe being one of them. And one of the big wins we've had to with our website is uh, pretty early on, we lowered our free shipping threshold. We typically have a, a fairly high one, um, but we brought that down just to make it easier for people to get their coffee. And we think that has done a lot for the volume of orders that we've seen come in. So we're looking at, we're doing a lot of analysis on, you know, what is that threshold once this is all said and done? What can we go back to instead of just being like, well, that was great for, COVID, now let's go back to normal. No, maybe some of those things need to be part of our everyday strategy. So I would recommend that everyone's kind of looking at those things as they move forward. Yeah, absolutely. One thing I'll mention real quick, Ashley, that I forgot and Aaron reminded me was that a lot of local merchants uh, that haven't necessarily had an online presence yet, there's a lot you can do within Google Shopping for local inventory. And so there's a supplemental feed you can sell Google. Hey, these are all the SKUs I have, but these subsection I have locally and you can pick up. So it can be purchased online, pick up right there and you know it's in stock. It's a lot of things you've seen uh, with Best Buy. They were one of the first out there. Like, hey, see this TV, buy it, come get it in the store, it's here. So I think a lot of coffee retailers that are selling the bags of coffee through their drive-thru possibly, you can do that, you know, click here and come pick up in the drive-thru scenario, which I think will be valuable in the future no matter what happens. Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, you can't go into a store and casually shop around and, you know, touch stuff and sniff stuff and <laughs> it's not the same experience. You want to know that it's going to be there um, before you get there. Um, so that's a, that's a really solid point. Dan, did you have anything that you wanted yeah. to add? Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say just maybe a couple of things. It's it's interesting where we're taking this lens of this conversation with somewhat of a presumption that business is good for coffee retailers selling online, that may not be the case for everybody. So worth calling out, obviously, SBA loans and worth you know, notifying this audience in case they were not aware. Um, Facebook has announced, and there's a, a strong partner of ours, a $100 million loan program. So if you are you know, Facebook advertiser, you're eligible for part of that program if you have between two and 50 employees. So something, if, if that is something that is, you know, would be helpful to your business, something worth exploring. Um, I think, you know, Ryan nailed it on the head, which is no one on this call today knows what the future holds. And so you need to be thinking about, you know, a couple of different scenarios. There are some foundational things that you always want to be thinking about if you're selling online. Though. What makes your site different? Um, and what might cause somebody to, to buy from you rather than go to a marketplace, which presumably you want that direct consumer relationship. I'm with the end customer, that, and, and that's the, typically the higher margin sale. And so, um, you know, are you thinking about merchandising the right way? Are you thinking about product bundles? Um, you know, in a recent survey, they found that um, obviously price and, and shipping and inventory are major components of what makes somebody go to a, a branded website versus shop in a marketplace like Amazon. Um, but But one of the top uh, uh, responses also were things like loyalty, trust, and then um, product like bundles and merchandising. Like, is there something that I get unique to your product plus something physical, um, something that's unique to you and, and how, what I can buy on your site that makes it worthwhile for me to go directly to you? Um, you know, if the future means we're going back to an office for sometime soon, um, all of these people started brewing at home. What's to keep them from just going and buying the dollar coffee on the corner on the way up to their office when they're in New York City or LA, um, rather than continuing to buy your coffee at home? So how are you thinking about what's your next, you know, your next email to them, your next subscription delivery? How are you thinking about capturing them? Are you sending them a mug to say, hey, 
you know, here's a mug for your next brewed, brewed cup of coffee right at home um so they continue that habit um even when they go back to the office i'm going to take the extra beat to make it at home rather than just pick it up pick it up on the way um, in terms of these times specifically the times we're in today i would strongly encourage um and aaron alluded to this uh curbside pickup um, it's not just for big box retailers um, most retailers at this point should be empowered and able to deliver uh, curbside pickup as an option. Um, so I would definitely consider that. And then I can speak for myself and those um, that I know, a lot of my online food and beverage uh, behavior has shifted towards using apps tied to grocers, right? So I'm here in Austin, Texas, and HEB is the biggest grocer here, and they have, you know, an app called Instacart. Uh, how are you merchandising Instacart? Are you available as a retail, as a as a coffee retailer on Instacart? What does that look like? Do you have pricing control? Is there a way you can actually push your products higher up on suggested searches? Um, I don't think that is going away, even if I could very comfortably walk back into an HEB without a mask and without having to stay six feet away from somebody in front of me. I may still continue to shop on Instacart after. And so how are you handling that as a channel, as a food and beverage retailer as well? Um, so just a couple of things that I think are, are really worth considering. And I know I spoke for a little bit too long there, sorry. <laughs> no, all great points. And just to expand um, with what we've seen in terms of that, like that trust factor and that experience, uh, the cu highlighting that customer experience, those are like really big, especially when, um, you know, people don't know who your brand is today and they're still in discovery phase. Um, you know, I've, I've been doing a lot of research because I'm in the New York City metro area and it's nearly impossible to find groceries right now. Like Instacart's booked out. Amazon is impossible. Fresh Direct's impossible. But I dug through Google and found on page three this uh, website that is putting produce from farmers that typically went to restaurants now out to residents. Um, but like I have to say I was very hesitant to pull the trigger because there was no reviews on that website yet. It was brand new uh, and they were lacking some content. And so, um, you know, obviously I reached out and offered them trust pilot so that they could help with their review strategy. But, um, you know, businesses, I think, even if you're in the early days of moving into the e-commerce space and selling online, having those that social proof with people like your, your consumers sharing their experiences with their your brand whether it's COVID related or not, is really good ways to help um, increase the conversions and optimize your website so that people are actually pulling that, that purchase trigger. Um, so I too was just a bit long-winded there, but I know that we are coming up on time. Um, so I do wanna just um, start thinking about some of the questions that have been coming in from the audience. Um, but while, we're getting to that. I know that uh, each of us do have a couple of opportunities available to our viewers today. Um, so I'm just going to pull up the slide with all of our contact details. Um, as for Trustpilot, for anyone uh, interested in either learning more about using our solution or using any of our paid business plans, um, we are offering two months for free on any of our paid options. Um, so I'll just plop that uh, link into the chat here. Um, and while I'm doing that, Dan, do you have uh, something that you can share that, that Big Commerce has on the table? Yeah, really quick. We're offering for, for new merchants, we're offering three months free on Big Commerce. So you can very quickly be live transacting, seeing sales volume um, before ever. Uh, paying a nickel for the technology that's powering it. So I um, want to make that sure that that's extended to the audience and feel free, you have my email address there. If you're somebody who wants to take advantage of that, just drop me a note and we'll get you set up. Uh, awesome, thanks. Um, Ryan, how about you? Is there anything that we could explore with logical positions? Yeah, so anybody that's on this webinar and wants to email me, uh, you'll be able to get a, an enterprise audit, which means we'll take some of our enterprise strategies and explain how that might be appropriate to a, a retailer of any size, but also get some feedback from me personally on some of our brands and what we're doing uh, in this time. Some of them are growing really aggressively. Some of them are paused. But how and why do we look at the data? And then I'll, I'll waive setup fees on, uh, on anything that happens between us if anything should make sense. So just feel free to email me. And I, I love talking business. And so 
let's talk business and figure out how to grow your brands. Mm -hmm. I will echo what Ryan just said. He, he was kind enough to stick with me for quite a few years <laughs> before we finally became a logical position client and he has a lot of really great insights. So I would definitely take him up um, on that offer. But if you're looking for coffee, uh, you know, it, it's kind of probably like preaching to the choir because you are all in the coffee industry and probably have your favorites and a lot of sources as well. But if you're looking to try a new one, uh, we are offering 25% off and free shipping. So the code is SCA25. And, you know, the biggest thing for us is one, we start with um, specialty grade one Arabica beans. So only the top, uh, the, the best bean out there. And then we are really known for our flavor variety. So um, if you got some different flavors you like, um, check us out, as well as Mother's Day is coming really soon. We have a lot of great coffee gifts. And so if you'd like to ship some to mom, use the discount code for that as well. Awesome. Uh, so we're going to leave the screen up with these, with everyone's contact information um, and some of the offers. Um, but we can move over into Q&A and we've got a couple minutes left here. So let's see what we've got. Yeah. Um, and I can, uh, we have tons of great questions coming in. Uh, so we'll start with the first one. Would the new Google merchant tool apply to companies that offer services instead of products? Uh, I'll probably, I'll take that one real quick. Uh, the merchant center is for physical products at this point. I assume at some point Google does some things with services and something similar to that. Uh, but if you are a service-based business, I would highly recommend doing the local, uh, the local verified ads where you can, if you search for an electrician or a plumber, you'll see that Google's verified this one and that merchant pays per uh, lead. And Google's done background checks on their employees. They've done a lot of work uh, to get that program very robust. So if you're service-based, look for that. Great, thank you. Um, and also, please, can you give some examples of ways to do the paid customer acquisition referred to at the start of the call? So, if, again, it's comes down to Google ads. And so the shopping portion of that, uh, generally head to head text ads that you see the text ad written out above the organic versus the shopping ads, which is the images of products. Generally the text ads are, or the uh, shopping ads are less expensive. And so you can actually generally get a lower cost of acquisition if you do your ads correctly. Uh, so you need a merchant center account, Google ads account, uh, ideally, all of you with a website should have Google Analytics already in place, uh, but utilizing Google Ads and then you and perfect world, you separate out people looking for your brand. So like what we did with Aaron and Door County, because they have such a strong brand, people that look for Door County, we capture as much of those as we can and make sure that they continue to find the source. And on the other side, it's the non-brand. So when somebody looks for a flavor of coffee mm -hmm. they happen to have, we have a set goal that we want to acquire a customer at based on that. And so perfect rule, you can segregate both of those. Great. And then to yeah, just further optimize. Just, oh, go ahead. Please, Ashley, go ahead. Um, no, I was just going to say, just to further optimize those ads, um, if you're working with a review provider that is a licensed party with Google, um, like, like us, we can help get those gold stars to show up in both the text ads and in the product listing ads, which can be great ways to help enhance your ad um, and make it stand out from some of the competitors as well. You will get a higher click-through rate, 15 to 17% just for having stars. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Well, one thing I would just add as a, as a channel to consider where some, some of our merchants are, are saying they're seeing great return in YouTube as a channel as well because you know you kind of as a, as a as a brand you have a sense of who your end customer is and um there's opportunity whether it's for you know videos that are related to your product but also you know videos that are targeted to who your target demographic looks like um we're we're hearing really a lot of merchants having really good return on ad spend across uh video properties as well great thank you um, so the next one, what are some of the ways, if any, that you or your teams have been thinking about how to maintain engagement as physical stores begin to reopen? I think we touched on that a little bit, but I wonder if there's anything, um, maybe Aaron, that you would add, but just thinking about engagement or customer engagement during that reopening time. Yeah, you know, I think it's going to come down to the way we had to quickly 
pivot our messaging right away from what it had been to now speaking more to the consumer being at home. I mean, we will have a little bit more preparation with this in a sense, but I think again, you're just going to have to, you just have to be prepared for change and looking at that messaging. How can you now speak more to where they are and basically just trying to be, whether it's your social, any of your, any of your emails, any of your ads, empathetic to what they're going through and try to speak to them where they are in the process. Um, we're also looking at adjustments to our welcome series because we know that we've gotten um, a much higher percent of new customers. Uh, we've seen, you know, in a monthly rate, we look at the percent new percent um, repeat and our percent new is uh, over this time period is up 15%. So we know we have work to do um, from a welcome series standpoint in email and, um, you know, subscription, like Dan mentioned, just ways to keep them engaged. But I think the biggest thing is just going to be we have to be flexible to um, follow where our country is at and where our customers are at and adjust our messaging along with that. Great. Yeah. yeah, I would maybe just I would I, Heather, I would even just jump on that and just add like I, I, I think the idea that people will want to continue to engage, I, I like even if the country opened tomorrow, um, you know, I, I I wouldn't be that person rushing back into every brick and mortar store. And so you mm -hmm. need to think about what does that transition look like? So I'm mm -hmm. seeing, you know, I'm a. Uh, I'm a coffee in the morning, glass of wine in the night kind of guy. And, and, you know, one of the vineyards I visited in Napa, they're holding, you know, like biweekly tastings. Um, so if you're a customer and you bought a box of their wine, they'll like pick certain wines for you and hold like a, a Zoom for all the people who have, who have purchased that package. So, you know, is there a special tasting you can do for certain types of beans or special beans for other bean of the month or something to that effect that, you know, fosters a sense of that community. Even if I went back into the store, I might still want to continue staying engaged, um, you know, with, with that, with that tasting every month. Um, and that can be really lightweight. It could be an Instagram live session for three minutes, right? But just think about how you can be talking to those customers. Great. Love that. Uh, next one, how would a new company with a conglomerate of branding be able to approach big commerce and be able to compete with platforms like Google and Amazon? So, I, I mean, I, I think I understand the question. Um, you have my email address. That's the best way to approach me. Um, the, the, but we do, that's what we do. We do that all, all day for over 60,000 merchants, um, you know, Procter and Gamble. They obviously sell predominantly through channels, but they use big commerce to power you know, if you go to Gillette.com, if you go to IvorySoap.com, I mean, those are all powered by big commerce. And Procter & Gamble is, is, is a sizable company, but we also power for tens of thousands of small businesses who are, who are trying to get a direct customer relationship as well, rather than rely on, you know, channels. And so we'd, we'd love the opportunity to have that conversation and see if we're a good fit for your business. Great. Um, I think we have time for one more. We're almost at the top of the hour. At what stage while starting up my own roastery would you suggest to hire an agency or a specialized e-commerce person to perform the online marketing for a coffee brand? Is right from the start recommendable? Um, I would say, as, yeah, as an agency, I would generally say you don't need an agency at the beginning. I mean, that's probably a weird thing to hear from an agency, but I would think... Uh, there's going to need to be a certain volume of spend really before it makes sense to figure out online marketing directly. Normally I would suggest, Hey, why don't you go to Instagram and Facebook and, and uh, find out who your user is going to be, see who your most valuable customers are going to be that buy your product. And then you can help find some of those people online. Try to get a niche first. Cause if you're just, let's just say you have three types of coffee, you have blonde, a dark and a, and a decaf coffee okay, how are you going to stand out there? So I, I think there's going to need to be some some brand first before it makes sense to advertise heavily. And a $1,000 on Google to cover. The country. I'm going to tell you there's. 
quite to spend. Okay, so, well, thank you so much. Um, this concludes our panel discussion for today. So thank you all for attending. And we'd like to, I wanna thank the panelists for taking your time and, and bringing your expertise to share. You know, everyone's very appreciative of it at this time. And thanks again to all our Expo Weekend sponsors, Pacific Barista Series as the title, and Saver Brands, Kimmick and Rostar as underwriters. Um, also be sure to fill out our post-lecture survey um, at the end of once this, this lecture stops, it will take you right there. And there will also be um, the link sent in a future email. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.